For those who don't know me, my name's John, I'm the vicar here, and I'm, I'm good friends with this man. I'm very grateful that um, Richard has come to join us this morning. Richard, tell us where you live. Uh, Cambridge. Cambridge, that was our link. Um, I lived in Cambridge for many years before being a Cockfosters boy. But where were you born? Play yourself on site. Uh, I was born in the Victoria Maternity Hospital in Barnet and grew up down the road in Potter's Bar where uh, I'm going to go and see my mum after this morning. It's her birthday tomorrow, so I'll go via Tesco's and get some flowers. Well done. Tesco? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're a North London lad. Um, what was um, your profession before? Actually, you're doing it now, but tell us about profession. Um, I am a surveyor by training. Um, so in property, sort of most of my life, I've, done, I've had a funny sort of career, sort of. Uh, so I've worked full time in churches doing youth work. You and I were on the staff together at uh, Christchurch in Cambridge. At the moment, I'm working for a company who are developing a robot to do surgery. So it's um, just talking to Lewis um, about the Cambridge being a sort of hub of innovation and all the brains up there. I'm not one of the brains that comes out of there. Um, someone close to People me People have guessed that, um, So the company is uh, developing a robot to do surgery. And it's very exciting, exciting and I'm looking after their property um, and they are forever needing more space. So I think I'll be in a job for life. <laughs> um, now you're, you're a follower of Jesus. Tell us, tell us when that happened. Um, Christchurch Cock Fosters does feature in the story actually because I had a friend who in Potter's Bar, a couple of years older, um, he used to annoy me because he used to tell me I wasn't a Christian and I used to tell him because I was uh, white and middle class and grew up in Potter's Bar than I was. <laughs> And, but he used to bring me along to Koinonia. Um, sometimes I'd accept the invitation, sometimes I wouldn't. Um, but when I was 18, um, the Lord finally, uh, well, I think I finally gave up and um, uh, asked Jesus to be my savior. Brilliant. And I know you are passionate about the good news of Jesus. What is the good news of Jesus? Uh, great question. Uh, I think it starts with God's holiness. It doesn't start with us, it starts with God. God is holy. Uh, that means that in every way, uh, he is perfect, justice, righteousness, generosity, patience. And I know that I am not, and I know that if I were to come before him uh, on my own, in my own, I'm stuffed. Um, and it's been said that God in his holiness is a bit like the sun, a burning sort of ball of fire and we are like a rag doll uh, soaked in petrol. So the, the notion that I can come close to God uh, in and of my own is a nonsense, and I know that. And therefore God in his mercy has sent Jesus. Jesus has lived the life that I can't live, the perfect life. He's died the death that I deserve for disobeying his law. And um, yeah, that's what it means for me to put my trust in Christ. Um, who lives the life, the perfect life I can't live and dies the death that I deserve. Yeah, brilliant. And you love telling people about that. How do you do that? Um, yep, yeah, so I'm, so I became a Christian when I was, I was thinking about this the other day, so I'm 56 now, so it's really scary to think that, you know, almost 40 years um, I've been following Jesus and I think to myself, oh, you know, how far have I come? You know, I sort of maybe come about that far. The journey is, of course, um, endless. Um, and I think where I've landed in person, you, know, you know, we talk about this sort of personal evangelism sort of thing, um, telling people the good news of Jesus. And I don't think it's really personal at all. I think that's an unhelpful term. And I've landed in the place of just saying to people, um, come along to church. So I'm in a workplace, 300 people, and um, I just love getting in conversation. And I say to people, uh, what would you say if I invited you to church? I don't say, would you, you know, how about coming to church? Because I think that's a sort of an unkind question. I think the easy answer there is to sort of say no, because it's a bit scary. But because I say, what would you say if I invited you to church? Then we enter into a conversation and it just goes whatever way they want to take it. And it's great. 
And at the end of the conversation, I say, well, you know, I'm, I am going to invite you to church, so be ready. And I just, I just irritate them down, really. <laughs> and, um, and it's a complete joy. So, so let me just commend that to you, you know, just with your friends and family. If we believe that, you know, in this good news, if we believe that this is a place where they'll receive welcome and acceptance, you know, and it's not just the word that's spoken from the front, it's the, it's the songs we sing, the welcome we receive. It is all the gospel commending it, and I think that, you know, it's corporate evangelism, which we do by inviting people. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and we're thinking about grief this morning. Just tell us, I know this has been very relevant to you in the last few years, tell us how that's been. Yeah, I think my... If I look at my life, I have to say that I am um, utterly blessed. Um, my wife tells me off because she says that sounds a bit sort of Christian, that, you know, sort of. But I am a very blessed man um, in many ways. And um, I think uh, the biggest um, sadness was losing dad um, about four years ago, I think. Dad was a very important figure in my life. Um, I'm one of five children. I'm the only one that follows Jesus. Um, but we grew up in a really loving home, and Dad was a brilliant dad. And I do have hope that I will see him again because we loved each other, and so he used to l listen to me banging on about Jesus. And I used to say, Dad, um, you love Jesus because you love what is right and what is good and what is true, but you don't know Jesus. And I do believe in the last months of his life, he gave his life to the mm. Lord. So, um, but that was, yeah, hard year, hard, hard time, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, well, we're, we're grateful you're here. I'm gonna leave it up to you. Lovely, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me um, such a lovely welcome. Um, chatting with Arthur, um, soon got on to Brexit. Doesn't take long, does it, in you know, this day and age? It's a, um, but really enjoying, man, enjoyed it. Um, shall I lead us in a prayer and um, that we get going? Uh, Father, thank you very much for feeding us um, with a wonderful breakfast this morning. Um, and we pray now that you would feed us with something even more wonderful, and that is. Uh, the truth and the hope that we have in your Son. Um, Father, you generously give us your Spirit um, who leads and guides into all truth. And we pray that he would be among us now. Uh, please take the words that I speak, uh, carry them to hearts and minds, and pray that we would uh, go away from this morning um, thankful to you for having made the effort to get out and get along. Uh, we pray in your Son's name. Amen. Uh, just three things uh, as I weigh into the subject, which sort of say a little thing about me. First thing I want to say is that I am at my best uh, when I remember that my life is not my own. Um, I belong to God, um, and I, he's, I belong to him uh, because he's made me in the first place. He used my mum and dad in that process. Uh, but he's made me. And secondly, I belong to him because he's, he's brought me back. Uh, I was lost, and yet he sent his son to come looking for me. So in many ways, uh, he owns me twice. He's made me, and he's redeemed me, brought me back. And I'm in a really good place when uh, I remember that, and I try and remember, remember that every day. Second thing I want to say, which I uh, think will be hope hopeful, helpful. Um, this is the verse, I don't know whether you've got your funeral worked out, but on my funeral sheet, this is, you know, if they get, you know, a picture of me when I've got some hair a few years back, uh, these will be the words underneath it. Uh, we live by faith, not by sight. In other words, we live by what God has said, what he has promised in his word, uh, not by what we see. Because I reckon that what we all do naturally is we live by sight, don't we? Uh, we don't live by faith, we live by sight. We live by what we see, uh, what makes sense, what adds up. And for me, this verse has become really special because 
um, we are called as followers of Jesus to live by that which we can't see, that which he has promised in the past, which is played out today and points to a glorious future. Uh, we'll come back to this in a moment. Third thing I want to say is that I have got a Bible man crush. I don't know if you're allowed one of those, but I've got one. Uh, so my big Bible hero after Jesus um, is Job. And the reason I love Job um, is I think Job was a brilliant father. Um, let me just read these verses from him, if you know anything about his life. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So Job really loved his kids, didn't he? Their eternal um, salvation was uppermost in his mind. And Job was a great husband. Uh, verse 31, um, chapter 31, verse uh, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And I think, goodness, Job is me. Because as a man, lust is a struggle for me. And here is a man who um, wants to uh, be so devoted to his Lord and to his wife that he daily seeks to keep that promise of not looking at a woman lustfully. So I think Job um, is a great bloke. Great father, great husband. And also, Job knows something about this business of suffering, doesn't he? If anyone in the Bible uh, can teach us the thing or two about suffering, if you know his story, um, and uh, when he lost everything, uh, I love these verses. I gave these verses to a friend this week um, who has lost. Uh, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. How does Job respond? By praising his Lord. So this morning, we're thinking about this, um, the business of grief. And it's a massive subject, isn't it? Uh, we're only going to touch upon it. As I've been struggling this week to work out um, what, I, what I want to say, what the Lord wants to say, I thought, God, this is, this is grief, this is. How on earth do I say yes to this? And I do want to say um, uh, we need to be sensitive because I'm conscious that coming along, not knowing anyone, uh, I don't know anyone's story, um, so if I say any words uh, which are unhelpful or clumsy, um, do forgive me. Uh, we're going to, um, at the end, uh, have some questions, uh, which I'll come back to in about 20 minutes or so, just around the table, um, just to follow up on what's been said, hopefully grounding it, and um, if there's any questions at that point, then I'll be delighted to... Um, take them, whether I can answer them is another matter. So grief. Uh, every Friday morning at seven o'clock, um, I meet uh, with a bunch of men to uh, open the Bible, to share our lives and to encourage one another uh, as we press on in faith. Uh, one of those men um, was uh, divorced many years ago and still lives today uh, with that hurt, the sadness of that uh, loss of his marriage. Uh, one of the men in the room uh, just this week uh, built an amazing company, um, given his all over the last five years, uh, has, taken, has had that job taken from him 
uh, just because his face no longer fits. One of the men, his wife, is uh, seriously Ill, Ill with cancer. Uh, <coughs> prognosis is unclear. One of the men, his brother, has just come out of prison. Uh, one of the men uh, hasn't been able to have children. The point being, grief is real. And I've no doubt that if we were to go around this room, and we won't, but all of us uh, will be able to tell a story, our story, either uh, from ourselves or uh, close ones, family, friends, of hurts, difficulties, struggles, either ongoing today or from the past. So the most important thing uh, just at the start is to remind ourselves that this is a real subject, isn't it? Grief, uh, what we're talking about. There are lots of things uh, that divide us as humanity, Brexit being just the one. Uh, but the one thing that unites us, which is uh, true for all, is this business of suffering. That uh, we all suffer. We all have suffered. We all will suffer at some point in my life, in our lives. And in my early life um, as a follower of Jesus, um, I sort of thought, well, I'm now on God's team, if you like. That means that, you know, all of life is going to fall into place and I'm going to avoid all the, the pitfalls, the struggles, the hardships. And of course, it wasn't long uh, before I realised that's nonsense. Because have you ever thought uh, of the characters in the Bible, uh, hundreds of characters mentioned by name? I can't think of one uh, for whom life isn't struggle. What about the Bible? So in the Bible, there are two chapters uh, at the beginning, and there is one chapter at the end. Two chapters at the beginning where life is perfect. Life is as God uh, intended, created it to be. One chapter at the end pointing to that new creation. What have you got in between? People will say that God doesn't know anything about suffering. But all of that, all of our Bibles, is the story of uh, suffering, struggle, as God deals with his people. So it is a live topic, a real topic. So I want to uh, start by acknowledging the reality, um, tempted as we might be to try and steer a course through which avoids uh, suffering and grief, uh, we will fail. But I want this morning to think um, how as followers of Jesus, and if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, uh, wonderful. If you're not, if you've been invited by a friend, equally wonderful. Um, I hope what we say is going to be an encouragement of interest. But as followers of Jesus, there is something that we can call good grief. It's a throwaway term, isn't it? The expression we use, oh, good grief. But actually, there is good grief. Uh, not that grief is ever good, but grief done well, grief done as God would have us, uh, can be good. Um, let me explain before I give a worked example. So suffering, suffering is, a, is a, a massive subject, isn't it? You know, we live in uh, a world, not the perfect world that God has made, it is a, girl, a world that's turned its, turned its back on God. And the result of that is a world, world under God's curse. And the result of suffering is this word grief. Grief is our natural, our emotional response to things which we know aren't right. And grief, um, if we are to live by sight, by what we see, by what this is all there is. Well, grief can lead to self-pity, uh, despair, and doubt. But there is another way 
uh, to approach our response to suffering. And that is to live by faith, live by what God has promised in his word, live by what God has said. And that is to do something what we call in this morning good grief. Good grief uh, means that the grief that we experience isn't meaning less, but it has meaning, it has purpose, it can be used for good. Uh, it points to hope, uh, the result is joy, and it can build confidence and growth. These two aren't binary, of course. You know, when we follow Jesus, we don't just go down the right-hand course. Uh, we will flip between the two. But the, the hope of this morning, the ambition this morning, is to pull us towards, remind us, that grief, uh, as doing grief as God would have us do it, um, has purpose. It can be used for good in our lives. I just want to have a worked example, quick worked example. On our tables there, I've just um, got a few verses from um, Paul's letter to the Philippians. So just pick one of those up and we'll have a quick whiz through. Let me read them quickly. Uh, Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambi ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers... And God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. What shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me." So if you want to know which way Paul voted in the uh, election, there it is, uh, down the bottom. Uh, I know that I will remain. He was a Remainer, wasn't he? It was our Paul. <laughs> Paul's in prison, chained to a guard uh, because he loves Jesus and he's been going around telling people about Jesus. So he's lost his freedom, his liberty. Uh, he's also lost his reputation. So can you see some people, other Christians it would seem, have gone around stirring up trouble um, while he's in prison. They're running him down. He can't be uh, who he says he is because, look, if he was, he wouldn't be locked up. And what's the outcome of all of this going to be? Well, we don't know. He's in danger of losing his life. He says those last verses, I don't know whether I'm going to live or die. So Paul uh, knows what it is to suffer. He knows firsthand uh, grief. And yet, what is his response to that? Well, here, and all the way through this letter, it's one of joy. It's one of um, excitement and anticipation. 
Because as he's chained to this guard in this prison, uh, and these guards, what they're doing is they're coming along, they're being chained to him, and he's telling them about Jesus. So they're going back and they're telling their families about Jesus. The next one on the next shift comes along, gets chained to him. So however long the shifts go, he keeps on these guards. They must have, some of them may be looking forward to it. I'm looking forward, I've got Paul today. Other was, oh, flipping out, I've got that nutter. But the whole palace guard, uh, everyone else, it's becoming clear that I'm in chains for Christ. You see, Paul sees himself as stationed in that prison by God. So God has got him exactly where he wants him to be. In the midst of suffering and grief, that's where God's got him. And that's a challenge for me and for all of us, I think, as we think about uh, our lives and the things that we struggle with, uh, where we have grief, uh, maybe in the past, maybe today, uh, maybe in the future, where life doesn't work out as we would plan and hope it to be. Might we see it as Paul sees it and think, well, actually, even in the midst of this trial, this grief, I am right where God would have me be. It's a completely countercultural way of seeing grief, isn't it? Because I see grief and my, my reaction is, oh Lord, just get me through this. Get me out the other side. I'll hold my breath, I'll get my head down, I will go through. But the lesson from Paul is no. Could it be that in the midst of this circumstance, however awful it might be, God is on the case. He's not fallen asleep. He's got us just where he wants us to be. So there is a little example from Paul's life. And the man is overflowing with joy. And he's able to say, you know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wonder how you would fill in that blank if it was blank. Uh, for me to live is my family, my career, uh, my golf handicap. What might it be? Here is a man who knows more about suffering and struggle than you and I like will, will ever know. And yet he, is, he sees, he understands good grief because he understands how God can use the hard circumstance uh, to grow him, to shape him, and not just him, others. So, just a few um, last comments as we um, draw to a close. So, so what is what is good grief then? Well, I wonder whether uh, three short comments. Good grief is to see the world as God sees it. It's to shed tears, um, good grief sheds tears, but knows those tears will come to an end. And good grief understands the importance of the local church, of gatherings like we are here uh, this morning. So firstly then, good grief sees the world as God sees it. Maybe a verse you're familiar with from the uh, beginning of Genesis, uh, not long after the fall. As God looks out on the evil of the world, he says, I will wipe mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. So at the beginning... As God looks out on creation, this creation that's turned its back on him and sees the resulting evil, he grieves. Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, heading to the cross, uh, followed by these women uh, weeping and wailing at what's unfolding, says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, uh, weep for yourselves and for your children. Jesus, as he looks out on uh, man, on humanity, uh, on this uh, Jerusalem, which was uh, supposed to represent 
uh, that wonderful meeting place between God and his people, uh, he weeps. And what does Jesus say on the um, Sermon on the Mount? Uh, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So as you read your newspaper, uh, watch the news on TV, what is your response to that? Do you see that in the same way as God sees it? Is it to, to weep, to grieve, and say, Lord, this isn't how you made it? And it doesn't stop there, does it? It's not something which is out there. It's much closer to home. But when you look into your own heart and you see... Um, there was a lovely story, I don't know if you saw it, um, on the BBC website in a week, and there was this um, Chinese influencer. Um, my children will tell you what that means much better than me, but I think that's someone who's got social media and they're out there. She's got about 100,000 followers, and she wasn't paying the rent, and her landlady was a bit fed up. So her landlady went around to the flat, and the place was a pigsty, such that there was uh, dog's muck on the kitchen floor. And the landlady thought, well, you know, it's payback time. So she put it up on social media. And I was saying to my wife, that's, that's a wonderful picture of sin, isn't it? Because here is me standing before you wanting to portray that image that she portrays to 100,000 followers, where inside, you know, God sees my heart. And when we look into our hearts, what is our response? Well, it's to, to weep, isn't it? It should be to weep, to mourn. But wonderfully, there is repentance. We don't stop there. Uh, we turn to God, uh, asking, uh, thanking him for his forgiveness, asking for it. Uh, so good grief, it sees the world, it sees our hearts as God sees them, and it grieves. Um, but there's a lovely little verse that I use uh, often, and a friend's mum um, was buried yesterday, and she, um, when the friend emailed uh, a week or two back to say that his mum had died, and I was going to say that she died prematurely, but I thought to myself, no one dies prematurely, because we all die... Uh, when the allotted number of years that the Lord has given us comes to an end. So when uh, James's mum died, uh, he said that uh, he talked about her love for Jesus and he talked about the sadness of her passing. And this verse came to mind, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn, mourn with those who mourn. You see, I've always seen that verse as being binary, you either rejoice with those who rejoice or you mourn with those who mourn. But for the first time, I saw that they, in the gospel, they're both held together. You know, it is rejoicing at that which is good and God has created a good world uh, full of wonderful things and it's mourning at um, those sadnesses, those griefs, that suffering that has entered his creation because of our rebellion. Secondly then, a good grief uh, sheds tears, but no, those tears will come to an end. Jesus was known as the man of sorrows, wasn't he? I always feel sort of sad that, you know, in the Gospels, you never see, you know, where does our humour come from? I love humour. Where does it come from? Well, it's, it's God-created, it's God-given isn't it? So Jesus created humour. But I, I never see in the Gospels him having a belly laugh, um, enjoying a joke. Because Jesus was the man of sorrows. Uh, as he walked through life and saw the brokenness of life, uh, his heart lurched and went out. Um, and as we've just been saying, that should be our response. And wonderfully, what are we told in the Psalms? Uh, uh, record uh, my misery, list my tears on your scroll, are they not in your record? So as we weep, 
Know for sure that it's as if God in heaven is catching those tears and measuring them. A dear friend of mine, um, uh, was, uh, his mother's just died. Uh, he was caring for his mother for 10 years. Uh, she lived with Alzheimer's. Uh, he cared for her in every way, personal hygiene, feeding, everything. And I used to say, Phil, you know, as you weep, know that God weeps with you. You know, he is not remote and detached. He is in, in it and with you. And can I tell you what a joy it's been to see Phil grow in his love for Jesus, in his confidence in Jesus, as he's walked through this hard path, these hard 10 years. So God sees our tears. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. It's a lovely sort of agricultural picture, isn't it? So our tears are actually being to be sown. Where do we sow them? Well, we sow them at the foot of the cross. We sow them uh, uh, with Jesus. And they will reap a harvest as our confidence in the gospel um, deepens and grows. And those tears uh, will... Uh, come to an end. Um, what does it say in Revelation? Um, in heaven, uh, Revelation 21, uh, he will wipe every tear from their eye. So while we weep today, we look forward with hope and anticipation to that world which is promised where there will be no more tears. Finally then, it is good grief understands the importance of the local church. Uh, what do we mean by that? We're not to do grief on our own. See, as a bloke, uh, when I struggle, uh, when something hard comes into my life, um, when I feel like I've got that thorn in my side that Paul talks about, uh, my, my instinct is to go in on myself and to retreat and step back. But good grief, I think, would have us do exactly the opposite. Uh, step out, uh, know that we've got brothers and sisters in uh, God's family, in the church, and to seek each other's uh, help, counsel, uh, through the hard times. Think about Job and Job's friends. Uh, they were brilliant, weren't they? Because they came along in his grief and they sat with him in the pit. And yet they were awful, weren't they? Because they were useless to him. Because, you know, they thought that they had it all worked out, and they didn't. And so good grief acknowledges that we don't have all the answers. There'll be loads of sort of uh, dots that we can't join up. But it's wisdom as we walk with each other, um, knowing how to respond, uh, what words to say. Um, and with my friend whose wife has cancer, uh, as I meet with him every couple of weeks, I'm always conscious of, I'm sort of, I don't want to be one of Job's friends. You know, what, how can I love this man through this real hardship? And what, what I tend to do is, the Psalms are full of places to go, beautiful truths. And it's just maybe sometimes giving him a verse of encouragement, you know. And sometimes it was not the right time to do that. Um, so know the importance of the local church. We need each other. Uh, there, are, there are no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Uh, God has made us for each other. Uh, and um, as we walk the path of suffering and grief, uh, that is one of the reasons why. Let's um, just then... Uh, Three, four minutes round table, John. Um, just turn to what is your attitude to grief? How well do you to respond to your own grief and or to the grief of others? And then how might we as men be better equipped uh, responding to that grief? Or you can say whatever you like, you know, talk about whatever you like. Don't need to be beholden to those. So just three or four minutes with your neighbor around your table, um, go. 
So if you go home and uh, into the office Monday morning, someone says, what did you do Saturday morning? You can say we did good grief. Because grief done with Jesus can be wonderfully good. Uh, two ways of doing grief. Um, like I said, they're not binary. Uh, any comments around the, the tables that um, would be helpful for others to hear? Or any questions um, where you're disagreeing with me or scratching your head or whatever? So we had two uh, people on the table here with uh, Lisa Reeves. Um, no, John. John. John here. Um, I think it's his nephew. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell about your... Well, yes. Uh, this, is just, this is two or three months ago now. 23 years old. He just dropped down dead in the bathroom going to the four to work. Uh, so that's been quite hard. I mean, I think um, if I was one of Job's friends, um, I may look for an answer, a neat answer. I think, I think that there are no answers, and it is to know that uh, God weeps. God is not um, distant. The question of suffering is so hard, isn't it? Because, you know, God is all powerful, uh, God is all loving. Um, how can He allow suffering? And yet, what someone said to me um, years back that God has done something about it, um, He's sent His Son. And when I'm talking to people about, um, the gospel, I'll often say that, um, you know, when we meet our maker, he's going to ask us one question. And I was having this conversation with a, a man at work, and uh, he said to me, uh, well, what's the question? And I said, well, Mike, I said, if you're really serious about knowing, the, knowing what the question is, um, you'll come back and ask me, so I'm not going to tell you now. And I said, sorry if that irritates you. Anyway, next week, he came back to me and he said, uh, what's the question he's going to ask us? And that's what I want to try and do with people, to sort of, you know, just put crumbs on the floor and take them with us. I think the question he's going to ask us is, uh, what do you think of my son? Because God has given his most precious thing that he's got, uh, knowing that we would come and kill him. And he hasn't done that for no reason. Um, so... God knows about grief and suffering uh, more than uh, we ever will. Um, so he weeps with us. Well, Mike mentioned a Muslim woman who was living in a very dangerous place and uh, she had a dream, was that right? Yeah. And um, she became a Christian. But... Um, which is great, she suddenly found happiness, she was saying. But as a result of that, there's some grief mixed in with it because she was no longer safe. Her family were um, aggressive towards her and she no longer was living comfortably. Yeah. So she swapped one thing for another. She preferred being in the loving arms of God. What does Jesus say if you want to um, save your life? Uh, you will lose it. And if you lose your life, in other words, if you give it to me, you will save it. Um, and, you know, he then says, you know, we must take up our cross uh, and follow him. And in the Roman world, to take up your cross was to go to your death. 
you know, it was to know that actually the life I know, I know is over. But actually, we are entrusting it to our maker, uh, who will give us far more than we can ever imagine. To me, following Jesus, I say to people, it's, a, it's an adventure. And I don't want my life to be boring. I want my life to be an adventure. And the more I live it, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I give myself to him, the more colorful and exciting it becomes. So fellas, can I just say, uh, if you don't yet know Jesus, come along to church tomorrow and listen and receive that welcome. Come along next week. And if you do know Jesus, well, just throw your lot in with him. Paul says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Richard, thank you so much. Difficult topic. Uh, I'm very grateful for the way you've tackled it for us and just given us a, a thread to, to think it through. Good grief. And why don't we show Richard our, our gratitude this morning. <laughs>